to the live broadcast of Metropolitan Community Church, Los Angeles. Indeed, O sovereign God, we bring glory to your name this morning. Just by being present, we have brought glory to your name. By allowing your spirit to move amongst us, we bring glory to your name. By allowing your spirit to manifest itself through our lives and through our bodies into the world and into this community, we bring glory to your name. Because your name is the name that we 
have chiseled upon our hearts. It is your name in which we do great things. It is in your name that we surrender ourselves and allow your spirit to maneuver within us so that we may be changed in the twinkling of an eye and brought to the very presence and the very likeness of Christ's self. So this morning, God, we feel the presence of the sovereign God in this place. And we bring glory to your name as we come as your people. So anoint us now as we prepare to worship, O oh God. Allow the manifestation of that spirit to spread like wildfire amongst us so that it no longer can be contained just by the walls of this building but moves beyond this place into our everyday living experiences. For it is in that that we find God in community, holy in one. Be with us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. Please be seated. It is, as always, a joy to welcome you to worship as we gather in the name of all that is holy, one with each other this morning. Uh, welcome to you, especially on this President's Day weekend. We know that so many folks have taken the opportunity to uh, leave town for President's Day, uh, but we also know that others have come into town for President's Day, so we are glad that you are here. I want to welcome you, especially if you're worshiping with us for the very first time this morning. We know that you have a choice in worshiping communities, but we are delighted that you've chosen to be present with us today. I wonder if you would indulge my spirit, if indeed you're with us for the very first time today. I wonder if you would just raise your hand and keep it up for a moment so that we can see you, uh, so that we can welcome you to worship this morning. Our ushers will get to you, but please do accept this flower and a brochure as our way of acknowledging your presence amongst us. Uh, inside the brochure, you'll find more information about our church and our congregation, and you'll also find a welcome card this morning um, that's designed specifically for you. It does ask for some personal information, but we ask that you complete that card. Later on in the service, we receive an offering, and we invite you to place those welcome cards directly into the offering plates. Uh, those cards will come directly to me. My name is Reverend Dr. Neil Thomas. I'm the senior pastor of our congregation. But along with every single person that surrounds you in this church this morning, we try to embody the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus Christ, not only here in this church, but in the world. And we sincerely hope that you've found a spiritual home with us this morning. We're glad that you are here. You'll also see that the ushers have passed out the welcome tablets, and so we invite you to sign in for us this morning. Please let us know that you've been present today. Uh, it's also important for us to know how uh, we may be able to minister effectively one with the other. And so if you're in need of pastoral care or if you would like a member of the staff to give you a call this week, uh, please do let us know by checking the box on the welcome card and we'll make sure that we follow up with you in the next week. Uh, of course, if you're in need of emergency pastoral care today, you do not need to leave this place without knowing that you are loved and cared for. So please feel free to speak to any one of us that served on the dais this morning or to our Minister of Congregational Care, Reverend Melissa Smithy, who's right on the front row this morning. Uh, she'll be delighted and we will be delighted to spend a few moments with you directly after worship and then, if necessary, make a follow-up appointment with you. But this morning, you're in the right place. You're surrounded by the hands and the feet and the love of Christ that is available to us in the world. So welcome to you. As you came in, the ushers would have given you your orders of worship, and on the front, you'll find the order of worship. Inside, you'll find more information about how we can make your visit today more meaningful, and you'll also find all of the announcements for today and for the upcoming weeks. Uh, we're a busy congregation, and not everything that we do get announced from the pulpit, and so it really is important that you take a few moments yourself and to familiarize yourself with the activities of our church, the programs and ministries, uh, to mark these dates on your own calendars, and then to participate with us as community as we reach out into the world, as we allow that spirituality to develop within us, and ultimately to transform ourselves as we transform the world. There are a few announcements for you this morning, so if you would just bear with me, I'll just take a few moments just to let you know. Uh, we are still taking applications for uh, those who have, of you who are called to lead our kids' club. Um, if you are interested in children's ministry within our congregation, uh, please see Reverend Dr. Pat Langlois. She's not with us this morning. She's uh, on a bit of vacation. Uh, but uh, if you'd like more information about that, please see me uh, directly after worship, and I'll be glad to tell you a little bit more about that. But applications are being taken probably for the next couple of weeks, um, and then Reverend Dr. Pat will be in touch uh, with you. 
Our men's spirituality group are stepping out for lunch, uh, for brunch directly after worship this morning. Uh, They'll be going to Palermo's on Vermont um, uh, Avenue, so please uh, do step out to lunch with them. Uh, Michael will have more information about that this morning. Michael's our board member on duty, um, and he'll have more information about that directly after worship, but they are stepping out to lunch today. On Valentine's Day, uh, for at least for the last 10 years, members of our congregation and uh, of other open and affirming communities in the area have usually gone to the courthouses to uh, apply for same-gender marriage licenses only to be turned away, uh, which has been the case. Um, This year, uh, we know that Prop Prop 8 is back in the courts and the Supreme Court will be hearing um, oral arguments uh, in March. Uh, We are joining together with California Faith for Equality and with Equality California and Breakthrough to Love and many other organizations in preparing ourselves uh, to be at the courthouse um, on, on, uh, in, in March when the oral arrange arguments are being heard. Pastor Lucia, Lucia Chappelle, who's our Minister of Justice within our congregation, uh, will be, yes, let's give her a round of applause. Couldn't ask for a better advocate for justice within our congregation. Uh, She'll be gathering some folks together tomorrow night. That's uh, February the 18th at 7 o'clock in the chapel. Um, If you'd like more information about how we can work together to bring awareness that uh, same-gender marriage uh, is as equal to opposite-gender marriage, uh, that all have the right to marriage equality, not only in our state but around the world, uh, please do meet with Pastor Lucia uh, tomorrow evening. Or if you can't be there tomorrow, please see her directly afterwards this morning. During the season of Lent, we're going to be opening our chapel for prayer, uh, for an hour of prayer every lunchtime, but, uh, Monday to Friday between noon and one. It will begin this coming Tuesday, uh, not Tuesday the 19th. It will just be an open space for you to come and to meditate for an hour or for a few minutes, uh, just to have an opportunity to know that that space will be open to you um, on uh, between the hours of 12 and one o'clock uh, here, just off the courtyard in the, uh, the lower, lower level. The New Queer Faith Forum are meeting this coming Tuesday. They meet on the first and the third Tuesdays under the wonderful eye and direction of Reverend Bruce Calkins, who's a retired Presbyterian pastor. Um, I do get that right these days. I always say an ex, but he's not. He's still current. Um, But uh, we are delighted. Um, I say this even when when she's not and you're not here, but we are delighted that... um, Reverend Calkins and his wife uh, are just doing such a wonderful job amongst us as queer folk. I remember speaking from this pulpit long before it was fashionable that queer does not mean LGBT, but queer means all those who stand against dominant culture. And I'm so glad that we have a straight couple who are demonstrating for us what it means to be queer uh, in this new world. They will be gathering uh, the first and third Tuesday, so this coming Tuesday, 7 o'clock, in the Rosa Parks room, which is uh, behind the sanctuary here. Uh, Just watch for the signs, and that's on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. I'm delighted to be able to let you know that Pos Spirit is returning to our congregation, uh, a support group for those who are HIV positive in our community. Uh, They are joining together on Saturday, February the 23rd from noon till 2 for a lunch. Uh, So if you would like to join them, uh, please do so. You can see Sammy or Tori or Michael. Uh, Please, if you just put your hands up so that people know who you are. They'll be gathering on February the 23rd at noon. Please see any one of them following worship this morning. And then our people of African descent within our congregation are inviting us on Saturday, February the 23rd at 5 o'clock for a discussion and reception um, uh, for the movie Brother Outsider. Again, you can see our Minister of Justice, uh, Lucia Chappelle, for more information. Lucia, I'm told that's here in the sanctuary, is that correct? Here in the sanctuary at 5 o'clock. There'll be discussion and a reception afterwards. It's free, uh, but of course donations are always welcome to help offset any costs that may be uh, accumulated for that evening. But please see Pastor Lucia uh, and she'll give you more information about that. As I said, we are an extremely busy congregation. So many things are happening, not only to edify our own selves, but to build us up as we go back out into the world. And But for now, the most important piece is our worship. It is that thing that lifts us and embodies us and strengthens us for the journey. So can I invite you now to turn to one another and offer a sign of peace, a sign of welcome as we affirm that God is with us this morning.
Good morning, Founders MCC. Morning. It's Black History Month, and I'll be reading this morning on uh, Sylvia Ray Rivera. Sylvia Ray Rivera was an American transgender activist. Rivera was a founding member of both the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay Activist Alliance and Help Found Star, which is uh, street trans uh, transgender action revolutionaries, a group dedicated to helping homeless young street drag queens and trans women. Rivera was born and raised in New York City and lived most of her life in or near the city. She was of Puerto Rican and Venezuelan descent. She was abandoned by her birth father, Jose Rivera, early in life and became an orphan after her mother committed suicide when Rivera was three years old. Rivera was then raised by her Venezuelan grandmother, who disapproved of Rivera's effeminate behavior, particularly after Rivera began to wear makeup in fourth grade. As a, re as a result, Rivera began living on the streets at the age of 11, where she joined a community of drag queens. Rivera's activism began during the Vietnam War, civil rights, and feminist movements, and fully bloomed around the time of the Stonewall riots. She often spoke of her presence within the Stonewall Inn that night of the riots. She also became involved in Puerto Rican and African American youth activism, particularly with the Young Lords and Black Panthers. At different times in her life, Sylvia battled substance abuse issues and lived on the streets. Her experiences made her more focused on advocacy for those who, in her view, the mainline community and often the queer community were, li were leaving behind. In May 1995, Rivera tried to commit suicide by walking, in, walking into the Hudson River. That year, she also appeared in the Arthur Dong documentary episode, Outrage 69, part of the PBS series, The Question of Equality. Rivera died during the dawn hours of February 19, 2002 at New York Street's Vincent's Hospital of complications from liver cancer. In the last five years of her life, Sylvia renewed her political activity, giving many speeches concerning the Stonewall riots and the necessity for unity among transgender people to fight for their historic legacy as people in the forefront of the LGBT movement. She traveled to Italy for the Millennium March in 2000, where she was acclaimed as the mother of all gay people. An active member of the Metropolitan Community Church of New York, Rivera ministered through the church's food pantry, which provided food to the hungry. Recalling her life as a child on the streets, she remained a passionate advocate for queer youth, and MCC New York's queer youth shelter is called Sylvia's Place in her honor. In early 2001, after a church service at the MCC, referring to the star announcing the birth of Jesus, she decided to reinstate street transgender, tra uh, street transgender action revolutionaries as an active political organization. Star fought for the New York City Transgender Rights Bill and for a trans-inclusive New York State Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act. Also, Star sponsored street pressures for justice for Amanda Milan, a transgender woman who was murdered in 2000. Sylvia also attacked the Human Rights Commission and the Empire State Pride Agenda as organizations which were standing in the way of transgender rights. On her deathbed, she met, she met with Matt Foreman and Joe Garbars of the Empire State Pride Agenda in order to no negotiate trans inclusion in ESPA's political structure and agenda. Named in, her, named in her honor and established in 2002, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project is dedicated to guarantee that all people are free to self-determine gender identity and expression, regardless of income or race, and without facing harassment, discrimination, or violence. Thank you. Before we have our reading this morning, uh, there are moments in a pastor's life when you receive an email in your inbox and you look at it and you wonder what on earth this is all about. Uh, it happened for me this week as I received an email from an Anglican priest uh, who was in Los Angeles for some ongoing continuing education units. And he asked if he could meet with me with regard to his own discernment process about what's going on for him in his own life and about his future ministry. 
And I thought, well, why on earth would he want to meet with me? I'm not an Anglican, I'm not a bishop, I'm not Pope yet. Um, <laughs> why on earth would he want to speak with me about vocational ministry? But, you know, I try to respond as openly as possible, and so I allow spirit to speak, and so I invited Reverend Brent to come and speak to me in my office on Friday afternoon, and we had a most wonderful exchange of conversation. During that, I completely understood why he wanted to come to speak to me, and I gave no magic solutions or no direction for him, but rather just to allow him to tell his story. And so this morning, I asked if he would be willing, in fact, he asked me if I would be willing for him to speak. And so for a few minutes, um, I've asked him to come and retell the story to us. We have Presbyterians, Anglicans, I don't know what. <laughs> but what a wonderful ecumenical witness that we are the body of Christ. So please would you welcome Reverend Brent this morning. speak to you. I doubt I'm going to be able to get through this without the tears to come with it. <laughs> About 25 years ago, uh, when I was starting my ministry, I was um, in, in seminary, ran out of money as normal happens when you are studying for a long time, and went to work as a hospital chaplain in the hospital in London, Ontario. Now, at that time, after about six months, I encountered the first AIDS patient that came into the hospital. It was absolutely devastating to everyone there. Uh, I was the one who had double gown, double bootied, hats, mitts, gloves, you name it, everything. You're not allowed to go anywhere near than three feet to this man. And the terror, they all stood outside the room and watched in. And I walked in and sat down with the man and he said, they're treating me like a leper. First thing he said. And he was the same age as me and I was helpless and devastated as well. I didn't know how to reach out to this man. I didn't know how to minister to him. Being raised in a very conservative small town up in the Ottawa Valley, no idea what to do with anything other than what was heterosexual. <clears throat> Shortly after that time, that man died about a week after I spent time with him. And um, I was talking to a friend of mine by the name of Clarence Crossman, who was the pastor at Metropolitan Community Church in London, Ontario, and he invited me to come and do my student pastorate at, that, at the church. And I did that at that point to the resistance of my wife and my family, who both didn't really think that that's the last thing I should be doing. And it was an incredible, welcoming, wonderful experience. About 15 years after that, my son had just turned 15. He was on the computer doing all kinds of things. Of course, he got off it, he went away, I got on it and discovered that the kid was exploring a whole lot of porn sites, which, as you know, at 15 years of age, you're kind of thinking, okay, what's going on? So we decided that I should be the one to sit down and talk with him. We don't do the father and son thing, take him out, sit down, we're having coffee, having a wonderful visit. And I said, by the way, kid, this is what I came across. And he said, Dad, I need to talk to you about something. He says, I'm questioning my sexuality. I think I am bisexual, and we talked a little more, and he says, well, actually, Dad, I think I'm gay. Now, at that point, <laughs> you, you act like a duck, you know, like on the top, the surface, everybody's calm underneath, you're paddling, like, and what do you do with this? And I was decimated. I didn't realize how much I carried with me being a dad who has the expectations of a son. So there was lots of tears, Lots of sorrow, lots of regret, gnashing of teeth, lots of questioning. And in the process, had met another man at a, at a church gathering, of all things, who was also gay, and he was my age, and we had a wonderful connection. And uh, he actually, after high school, when I sent my son to Toronto, he and his partner mentored my son during that year of him coming out and exploring what it meant to be a gay young man. And I was so worried about him because... He's, he doesn't have the social skills. He, he, had, he was a little inept in some areas, and they were able to help guide him through it because I was worried about the harm that could happen to him if he wasn't mentored. 
Last year, my daughter graduated university and we were driving her back to her mother and uh, she said, oh, by the way, dad, I'm lesbian. <laughs> the, gift, the gift that this church gave me was the capacity to be able to respond in a way that was loving to her and to her brother, to be able to receive both of them, to acknowledge them for who they were and the blessings that they are in my life. And I will be internally grateful and thankful to you for that gift, for what you bring to all of us. Thank you. Good morning. The scripture reading today comes from Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then the Spirit led Jesus to the desert to be tempted by the devil. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. After this, he was very hungry. The The devil came to Jesus to tempt him, saying, If you are the Son of God, tell these rocks to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written in the scriptures, A person lives not on bread alone, but by everything God says. Then the devil led Jesus into the holy city of Jerusalem and put him on a high place on the temple. The devil said, If you are the Son of God, jump down, because it is written that in the scriptures, God has put his angels in charge of you. They will catch you in their hands so that you don't hit your foot on a rock. Jesus Jesus answered him, It also says in the scriptures, Do not test the Lord your God. Then the devil led Jesus to the top of a very high mountain and showed him all the places of the world and all their splendor. The devil said, If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all these things. Jesus said to the devil, Go away from me, Satan. It is written in the scriptures, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only God. So the devil left Jesus, and angels came and took care of him. Hear what the Spirit has to say. Let mercy fall on 
I invite you to be seated, and uh, if you would join with me in a moment of prayer. God, we are so thankful this morning, so thankful for testimony, for witness, for your word, for the people who gather around us this morning, for the incredible move of your spirit that continues to surprise us, shows up amongst us, brings tears of joy and tears of healing. God, we are so thankful that you continue to be present with us even in this day and in this age. And so in honor of that presence, God, we surrender ourselves, we open ourselves now to the revelation of your word, to the understanding of your word and the application of that word to our own lives and to our own church. We ask, God, that you would again show up in the interpretation of this word. And may that interpretation be uh, around us and within us, embody us this morning. Help us now as we have brought ourselves into your presence, as we have prayed, as we have sung, prepared ourselves, our own vessels, our own temple of the Holy Spirit to be in relationship with you as your Spirit speaks to us. And now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, those of you who were around at Christmas would have remembered that I did a sermon series uh, around the Christmas season that was also the same sermon series that they did at the Hollywood and Highland United Methodist Church. Uh, Christmas, it's not your birthday. And so this year, uh, being you know, a, a little savvy, a little bit more clever, um, I checked out to make sure that Hollywood and Highland United Methodist Church didn't do the same sermon series for Lent uh, that I decided to do for us. You know, too much competition in this town. <laughs> I chose for this ser- sermon series throughout this series of Lent to talk about uh, giving up. This year more than chocolate to talk about the reality that Lent is not just about superficially giving stuff up. Although for some, giving up chocolate may not seem superficial. (laughs) But that giving up is something that we do as a spiritual discipline. It's something that we do to align our lives with the presence of Jesus the Christ. That Lent is an opportunity for us to renew ourselves, uh, to re-engage ourselves with spirituality, to enable ourselves to journey with Jesus in those days in the wilderness and to remind ourselves that in that spiritual journey, there is opportunity for us not only of an inward journey, but from the inward journey to have an outward expression that makes a difference not only in our lives, but an expression that changes the world. It is an opportunity for us to take these 40 days and 40 nights between uh, Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday to prepare ourselves to come out of the tomb and to find our own resurrection and in that resurrection find transformation. That is the gift that we're offered in this season of Lent and so giving up is an opportunity for us to think about what it is that we need to give up from our own lives in order that transformation might happen. Giving up more than just chocolate giving up more than just chewing gum, giving up more than just that morning cup of coffee? I don't think so. (laughs) 
What a world it would be. (laughs) Giving up some stuff from our own lives in order that we might find that transformation. This morning, I want to speak about giving up control. It's a biggie. Giving up control. Now, those of you who know me uh, know that I can be a bit of a control freak. (laughs) Amen? Yeah. Oh. We have affirmation from our signers this morning. That's enough of you, Roger Owens. Giving up control. The reality is that I don't think I'm the only one who wants to be a control freak. Do I get an amen this morning? (laughs) Sometimes I wish that control was a spiritual gift listed in the list of spiritual gifts that the Apostle Paul gives to us. But it's not one of those spiritual gifts. But we've been taught in our world to take control. Take control of things, take control of people, take control of places, take control of outcomes. We've been taught in our world to take control. And the reality is that control is something that in my experience, and I'm sure in the experience of many of us, can often lead us to places that we perhaps would not want to go. Control, giving up control. In the 12-step tradition, they talk about how we need to give up control over people, places, and things. Because the reality is that when we take control of people, places, and things, not only are we disappointed, but the reality is that we have no control over people, places, and things. And the only person or the only thing we can really have control over is ourselves and our reactions and our responses to the circumstances of our lives. Jesus needed to give up control. In the story that we had from the New Testament, from Luke's Gospel, we hear about Jesus being tempted by the evil one, the devil, by circumstances of life. All of us find those moments in our life. Control isn't something new. I think sometimes we think that control is something new in our world and in our world, but control is something that's been around from time and eternity. Uh, Bless you. I think even in the story from Adam and Eve, right at the very beginning of Genesis, we see issues of control. Controlling what their environment should look like. Controlling what the garden should look like. Controlling where their place is in relationship to God is. You know, I'm not one of those people that believes in original sin. I'm someone who believes in original blessing. I believe that every single one of us deserves to be blessed in our lives. But, and I don't believe that the original sin was something that was contrived by women against men. That's something, yeah, thank you. I, I love it when the women affirm that for me. You know, I know that I can be a feminist, but the reality is that I do believe that original sin has been set up to persecute women in our world. And that original sin was placed upon women to make them feel guilty for the rest of their lives. To set up this patriarchy, this line when men are on top. It's original sin. I believe in original blessing. I I believe that the sin of Adam and Eve was not about uh, finding themselves naked. I believe that the sin of Adam and Eve or that situation in the garden was that they first encountered guilt and shame about their bodies and about how God had created them so beautiful that they had to cover them with fig leaves. God wanted us to find blessing in our lives. And they wanted control. They wanted control over their circumstances, their people, their places, and their things. And God was disappointed because all that God wanted was a relationship with Adam and Eve that would be fruitful and would multiply and encompass this earth as co-creators and co-partners with God. That's why I believe Jesus had to come, was to set it all right again, to kind of start the whole story all over again so that the folks could come to an understanding that the relationship that Jesus had with God was a relationship that was open to each and every one of us as we encounter original blessing about who we are, free of guilt, free of shame, but freedom in this relationship that we establish with God. Jesus was in this moment of wilderness. He found that in this place, 40 days and 40 nights, 
Who else would be hungry and thirsty after such an ordeal? Even the best of us that are on the most keenest of diets would be hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. In that moment, in those moments of temptation, in those moments of desperation, those are the times when we can be most tempted by almost anything. And it was that moment that the evil one, the devil, the presence of the unholy came to Jesus and tempted him with all power, with all knowledge, with the testing of his God. And Jesus had the fortitude of his own life to arrive to a situation where he knew that the control, whilst it may have been offered to him, was not something that he was willing to take. But rather, the control would be given back to the God who was in relationship with Jesus even in that moment. How many of us have found in our own lives that when we have neglected our spirituality, when we have neglected to come to church on a regular basis, or is that the Easter sermon? No, when we have found ourselves... (laughs) Always not try to make people feel guilty for showing up on an Easter Sunday morning. When we have neglected a moment of our lives that is about this relationship with God, that it's in those moments that we can be tempted to do the wrong thing. That we can be tempted to do something other than what we would normally do if we had reestablished or awoken our relationship with God. You see, this control thing is something that we so often take to ourselves, and yet we are being asked this morning not to give up control in the sense of abdicating our responsibilities for life, but rather giving up control so that we can yield it to a power that is greater than ourselves, the one that we call God, yielding it to the one who has our best interests at heart, You see, I think sometimes as Christians, when we talk about giving up control, we somehow believe that we somehow are then giving over power to something bigger, to to God, abdicating our responsibility. I don't think that's what giving up control means. I believe that when we're invited to give up control, what we're being invited to is to put on the mind of Christ, to put on the spirit of the holy, to put on, to be in partnership, to co-create, to add another dimension to our decision-making process, and to be in the will of God. And the only way that we can be in the will of God is by knowing God in our lives, knowing what that means, what that encounters, what that feels like in our body. I know what it feels like when I'm not in the presence of God. You know, it's something doesn't quite fit. You know, there, there are times in my life, you know, I almost try to be as honest and, and, and authentic from the pulpit as I can be. There are moments in my life when I know that I have neglected my relationship with God to such a moment that the decisions that I make have not been very good. The decisions that I have made have been about my will, about what I want to happen about how I want to manipulate situations. Anybody else identify with that? Or am I just, oh, praise Jesus. You know, it makes it so much easier when I don't feel I'm just up here on my own. (laughs) But when you try to manipulate those situations to make it all about my way, my control. Now, I know that you know, as some of those around, and those of you who are brand new, this is the first time you've heard this, but you know that I know that my favorite karaoke song is My Way, by Frank Sinatra. (laughs) You know, it's one of those uh, contradictions of my life. I want to sing my way, but I don't want to do it my way. But the reality is that I know when I try to do things my way, when I try to hold on to control, I make some big mistakes. And yet, when I yield that control, when I allow God to be in partnership with me, When I go to God in prayer, when I go to God in a way that makes sense for me, something happens and something transforms and something changes so that my will and God's will are then in sync. And often it means that I have to change my will in order that God's will can step in. And when that happens, surprisingly, when that happens, 
things have a way of working out. All things work together for good for those who love God. You see, friends, we are called this morning as we enter into this period of Lent to give up on control, to give up trying to have it your way or my way, to give up trying to manipulate situations, to give up in order that we might find ways for God to encounter us and to change us. Giving up control is not about abdicating responsibility to a third party and just living and asking that third party to, to move you around like a chess on a chessboard. It's about being in relationship with God so that you and God and I and God and we and God can be in such sync that when we make that move, it's God's way. It is the way that it's supposed to be. And so often in our institutions and in our places of worship, we, we just plow through the world without taking a moment to stop and call the church to prayer or call ourselves to prayer and say, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing next? That's what Reverend Brent was asking when he came into my office last week, was, is this what I'm supposed to be doing next? Whatever this is, great lesson of discernment and of understanding. I'm sure there are many of us as we are facing crossroads in our lives or even just everyday decisions that would take us just a moment just to stop and say, how can I yield control one more time back to the God who I believe was with Jesus in the hour of temptation, who I believe was with, with Adam and Eve in the very beginning of the garden, who was with the prophets as they led the chosen Israelites through the maze of activities and dilemmas of their life, who was with those early disciples as they tried to figure out what did it mean when Jesus was hung on a cross and rose from the dead, what it mean to those early worshipers as they struggled to find out what to believe and what not to believe, and continues to struggle with us in our yearning to find out how do we make sense of this world. But more than that, how do we make sense of you and me? It is in those beginning moments of yielding that control that we can begin to see a light at the end of the tunnel, that we can begin to see a way through. That's why Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's so that we are in partnership so we can see the way through. It's no longer blurry and fuzzy. It's like a laser beam has been shot through and we can see the way. We don't, might not know how to get there. But it's the way and it's the truth and it's the life that leads us there. Friends, this morning as we begin this Lenten journey, I'm going to invite you to give up control. Give up control. But don't abdicate your life to another person or even to God. Be in partnership with God, a co-creator with God, an anointed one by the presence of the Holy that can touch us right at this moment. It is in that moment that we put on the mind of Christ. We put on the embodiment of Christ in our lives. So we're ready to give up some control. I'm not sure just yet. <laughs> You see, it's a process. Well, at least it is for me. It's a process by which we must be committed. So 40 days, 40 nights. It's the beginning of a journey to allow ourselves to see God's will and our will, hopefully in union and with harmony, so that when we step out of the tomb on Easter Sunday morning as resurrected human beings we find that the way of our lives has met the way of God's will for us. May it be so as we give up control. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Beloved and holy and thankful one, we are so grateful that you continue to speak to us through the stories of old and through our experiences of the day and the present. So help us this morning, each and every one of us, myself included, to yield some control. To know from our own experience that when we try to do it my way or our way, sometimes we mess up a little bit. 
There's no guilt and shame about that. It just happens. So help us to see a better way, or a different way, to try a different way, to be in relationship with you, to be a co-creator with you, so that in that co-creation, putting on the mind of Christ, just as Christ did when He was tempted in the wilderness, that we too may be able to say, get away from me, Satan. Move out of the way those decisions that would lead us to oppression and destruction. Get behind me those situations that we know from experience have not done us any good. And bring to the front, the forefront of our lives, the ways of God's will for us so that we may be faithful in our relationship with you. And now, Holy One, I pray that you would take the words that have come from my mouth and not allow them to return to you without blessing us, shaping us, challenging us,